Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the narrative lectionary, although this is not a narrative part. This is a summer podcast, a series on 2 Peter, the uh, yeah, Peter's second epistle to somebody. Uh, and we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, we are joined by Christopher Fan Kaufman, my colleague at Luther Seminary, and Shively Smith. Shively, why don't you introduce yourself to listeners who might not uh, know your voice as well? Absolutely. I am Shively Smith, Assistant Professor of New Testament at Boston University School of Theology. And I typically do a whole lot of things in Peter. So I literally just uh, came out with my newest book on Second Peter called Interpreting Second Peter Through African-American Women's Moral Writing. So it's just even a couple of months old. So I'm living in Peter world these days. That is awesome. Uh, Christopher, anything uh, you want to add about yourself before we get going? I'm really, really looking forward to this conversation to learn more about Second Peter. I'm a little bit in my own work, a little bit. I don't want to say I'm anti-Peter, but I'm pro-Paul. And Paul and Peter have a really interesting relationship. And so the way in which that plays out, I think that part of that will come up as we talk about the book of Second Peter. So I'm looking forward to this. Reminder that there is um, there are commentaries for the various weeks on the website. Uh, we have one podcast uh, to cover the whole thing. So let's start with the introduction. Um, Shively, I noticed that you used... Uh, that a lot of words that make me think you're pretty negative on Second Peter. You, you talk about him as profiling and targeting. And of course, those words are, uh, in our culture, pretty loaded words. Yeah. Um, part of the, so, so part of the loaded words that is intentional, and yeah. it, is, it is to create that moment to actually slow down and to put into context and perspective, I would actually call it a clear hearing of what the rhetoric, what the language of Second Peter is doing and how is it doing it. So um, one of the things that I think is so important to, to pay attention to with Second Peter is uh, it's doing quite a lot of name calling in three chapters, right? So, 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 Second Peter's calls the, the, its own members cursed people. It's waterless springs. Um, literally uses parables of um, making um, connections and analogs to uh, pigs and dogs to its own members. And so, I use that language in the in the narrative to really in the lectionary to really slow us down to not read over over, ignore, excuse, mishear, how strong, how strong and jarring the language of Second Peter should be to us. That's really interesting. I wonder, as you have studied Second Peter and as you've thought about that language, if you could give us a little, where is this language coming from? What is going on to inspire such strong imagery from the author here? Yeah, I think it's really important to think about Second Peter in the larger canonical history of the New Testament. Most scholars who are engaging in canonical history and canonical um, studies, biblical criticism, and were thinking about the dating of the letters. When did they um, emerge from the life and the story of the early church? Second Peter always my book starts off by calling Second Peter the baby of the family. So, so Second Peter is the letter that's, that most scholars end up dating as the latest to um, come into existence. And you see, uh, which means uh, it. And if you think about early Christian history and storytelling and belief and sharing as a tapestry of connected stories and traditions that are being told and retold in local context and communities. Second Peter has a lot of traditions available to it by the time it's the baby. By the time the baby comes into the plant family, there's a lot that the baby can choose to participate in, <laughs> learn and use, or just turn it to totally to their own. I have my youngest, my youngest daughter to be is an example of this, is that she's in a house full of all of us are the oldest, and she's the baby in the baby of babies, the baby even grand grandchild. And there's amazing to me how she has inherited all the family stories, and yet she kind of does her own thing with them when it suits her. 
And Second Peter seems to do this. So in Second Peter, you get a gateway to the Gospels. You get echoes to the Transfiguration and the Bapt and the and the Matthew's baptism. In Second Peter, we get echoes to Noah and um um. Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah, the angels. Second Peter gives us echoes to Peter himself, right? His own story and prophetic location. All of this Second Peter is doing only to seem to change to change the purpose of it, to repurpose it in order to make a sort of sifting effort to talk to people in the community who know these traditions as a way to identify those who are aligned to the commitments of the traditions that are already in the community and those that they're saying who are making other decisions about how to understand or li live out the traditions. What's so key um, in Second Peter for us to pay attention to is the fact that this is an insider conversation and conflict. It is an insider sifting of people that are already in the community as opposed to something like First Peter, where we're talking about um, um, uh, sort of a persecution and the stress coming from outside the community onto the community. In Second Peter, we go inside and that language is in service to that. So that's kind of, it's a different move. So you can't even say it's doing the same thing as First Peter's doing. It is not. It's, it's doing something different with this language. That's really interesting because one of the books that I'm very interested in is the book of Revelation and looking at the way that is also one of the babies of the New Testament. And that exactly. you see similar rhetorical moves in terms of the very strong targeted language and especially right there in Revelation 2 and 3, those seven letters to the churches are explicitly for That's insiders. Right. And so it's interesting to think yes. of those two as kind of occupying parallel spaces. So thank you for that. Yeah. And yeah, absolutely. And I would say Revelation and Second Peter are really two good good writings of the New Testament meant to put in conversation, particularly because of the apocalyptic nature mm -hmm. of both of them, particularly Second Peter three, because a great conversation partner to the apocalyptic literature and imagery, and like you said, use that's occurring in Revelation that we have to pay attention to as well. I have, I'm gonna, I wanna, I'm gonna hold up for our listeners or viewers two things that uh, Shively said, and then I wanna ask a question. So just, I really found it helpful what, what you said to say, the purpose of, of uh, calling out this language and uh, your intentional use of these very um, uh, bound words is to give a clear hearing to that's Second right. Peter. And that to think about it as a tapestry of uh, connected stories and traditions. I really like that, that you can see that, that the author of Second Peter is interpreting scripture, That's which right. you don't always, you don't see, well, including New Testament scripture, like when Paul does, writes Romans, he's mostly interpreting Old Testament scripture. That's right. Then the thing uh, you just uh, now, I just probably should have written it down. I got my little post-it notes and I didn't get it written down fast enough. But something you said, uh, it'll come back to me that I was going to ask you guys. Oh, yes, it came back to me now. All right. Uh, As an Old Testament scholar, when someone says this is apocalyptic literature, yeah. well, that that means a specific thing to me. And I don't New Testament scholars don't mean the same thing usually to mm -hmm. me. Oh, apocalyptic is a genre where you get visions that are misunderstood and then a heavenly messenger has to be sent to explain to Daniel what the vision means. And then there's, you know, the, the visions are always symbolic. That's, right. That's not what New Testament people necessarily mean. So what do you guys mean by apocalyptic stories here in first, uh, second Peter and revelation? And Christopher, I'll let you start with revelation because that becomes my count talking space as well. Sounds good. Yeah. So one of the things that when we look at the Greek name of the book of Revelation is the Apocalypse of John. And this is actually where we get that apocalyptic word. And in terms of the New Testament tradition, we often talk about these writings that interact with a couple of things. One is they're interacting with uh, traditions from what we call the second temple period. So the temple that's, that's right. rebuilt during King Herod's time, and you get books that are somewhat, they're kind of bridging the gap that you're talking about, Rolf. Books like Fourth Ezra and these books that talk about angelic visitors and visions, but are also trending towards what we see in Revelation, 
these coded messages about the end times or these coded messages about what they see as the coming reign of Christ. That's something I think that you talked about in the the commentary, Shively, is this relationship that Second Peter is trying to draw there. So would you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, you you, you set me up quite nicely. Good. Thank you. I mean, so, so exactly. So particularly when you get into Second Peter, apocalyptic really is about future facing and the question of the future history, the, the hit history that is ahead of us for the community and the world. So the clearest place where you see this apocalyptic register showing up, Christian apocalyptic register showing up, is in Second Peter 3, 4, where it becomes very explicit, if I may read it. Uh, they will say, where is the promise of his coming, of his parousia, for ever since the fathers fell asleep? So that's that sort of echoing back to um, uh, Old Testament Jewish tradition, Israelite identity, we're bringing it forward, forward prophets. Um, for all, ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. And then you, you literally enter into this apocalyptic conversation. So in Christian apocalyptic literature, as, Chris, as Christopher, you were saying, and here, particularly in Second Peter, we are talking about an understanding about matters of time, about matters of history, and about how that matters, how that matters, <laughs> how, how that shapes Christian identity, Christian belief, and tr Christian practice, right? And so the pressure of, of this apocalyptic expectation, the expectation of what will or will not happen in the future is significant because we're talking about what should the community be doing now? What, what is right belief in this moment? And what should they be, be believing toward is how I like to talk about it. What are they believing forward um, in this? Awesome. Well, let's, uh, first of all, I just want to say one of the reasons I love doing these podcasts on uh, our work in preacher narrative lectionary is because I always learn. Uh, for years, I was doing the other podcast and this one. Everyone was the best continued education I get. And I've already entered into that uh, as, a, as an Old Testament uh, teacher stuck in Psalms. Uh, which is not a bad place to be stuck, but it's nice. Oh, it's a wonderful this place. Is a nice, this is a nice lane to stroll down in July. So let's talk about the first uh, the first lection on mm -hmm. Second Peter mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. uh, one through ten uh, is uh, I just lost my note one through eleven right right mm -hmm. all right I know my uh, colleague Peter we teach uh, excuse me Christopher. We teach together, so I know what he thinks about certain things. Ah. I'm, this is a little sidetrack, but I am I can't wait to hear you talk, Christopher, uh, about the difference between the text that I have says Simeon Peter. Yeah. But there are um what is it? There are other traditions of New Testament manuscripts, so there are variants that say Simon Peter. Mm -hmm. So you get a Semiticism, Simeon, and a Greekism, Petros. And I know, Christopher, that you are terribly interested in this. I am terribly interested in this because one of the things, so one thing for you to know about me, me Shively, is that I am a Cambodian American. My father is an American and then my mother is from Cambodia. And I'm very interested in these cultural meetings we see in the New Testament. And so as Rolf pointed out, we have this name, where we have one part is uh, of Hebraic origin and one part is of Greek origin. One of the things that is very interesting, though, is that this use of Simeon, this is one of the few places we see that in the New Testament. And there is some, I wonder sometimes if this is a little bit of that Shakespeare protesting too much, that this is the author of Second Peter really trying to point out the Semitic and Hebraic nature of uh, their authority. Whereas so often we only see this, this very kind of Greek form, Simon or Simon. So I'm interested in that, That's first right. of all. But then also the way in which this is showing us a person, appealing to a person who bridges these two worlds, who is trying to be in kind of two places at once. So I'm glad that you have highlighted that. 
Yeah. And so then I, I find myself giggling, Ross, because then I end up saying, this is probably where you, you could come back and say, but then it seems like you're not happy with it. <laughs> I name it and say, but then Peter doesn't do a good job, right? So, <laughs> so, so there's a couple of things I think that's important to note here that I echo. And Christopher, I love this. What did you say? The, um, meetings of cult. Yeah, what did you say? Cultures it's just where two cultures come together. Yeah, yeah. I love that. I love that image. That phrase. I'm going to use that. The place where two cultures come together. Absolutely. This sort of double naming of Peter here is so unique and significant. It steps away from what you see in First Peter. Um, uh, number one, but it has an echo. So again, there's an echo back to tradition. So it echoes back to Acts 15 when you have James and then Jerusalem Council and um, they're trying to adjudicate, adjudicate and, med and mediate these questions of r relationship between again um, a sort of Jewish identity and now this you know non-Jewish identity that's a part of the community. And so again, we get these meeting of of worlds coming together and and James stands up and ends up and and uses the Hebraic name of Peter in this in in this space to to engage in um uh and to engage in a sort of mediating moment that tries to create consensus relationship and connectivity in a mixed community that is already established, right? We're talking about relationships and proximity that are already there. We're saying, what do we do with this? This moment in Second Peter seems to echo back to that Acts moment and then make a different decision. Second Peter gives us this meeting of two worlds and does not fundamentally hold up to adjudicating and mediating the differences of worlds, of perspectives, of understandings of the tradition in the rest of the letter. So this is one of the reasons why I say at the very beginning of that lecture of that particular section that we need to exercise a certain degree of thoughtfulness and awareness that the option that this letter uh, exercises when talking about the meetings of the worlds is not the only option that's canonized in our scripture. It, it, it echoes something and then doesn't do that, uh, that, that thing. It does its own thing. And so that's important for me. To, that, for me, that's an important moment to highlight, to say within our scripture, when these two worlds come together, there are other options about what can be done when there is fundamental disagreement, right? Misunderstanding within the community. I think that's great. And I think it's so important because when we talk using that image of coming together, we have to understand sometimes they come together and don't get along. That we mm -hmm. sometimes have this sort of idyllic idea that just because two right. meet, they will instantly be friends and they you know there will be peace and harmony and so forth but i think you see this also yeah. in the way in which paul is trying to mediate this uh meeting of cultures and sometimes it's in a very positive fashion and sometimes it's in a very negative fashion so i'm glad that you highlighted that even if we've got the same word and the same name you can they can be employed for different uh, different purposes and we need to be aware of that that's fantastic i mean you can, you can think of so many examples where this has, has happened and is happening in our culture. That's right. Um, so that when my ancestors came over, at first they worshipped in Norwegian, but then the kids, and then by the third generation, nobody spoke. So they had to, there were fights within churches or the old Norwegian church would say, we're just going to start an English speaking church literally next door. But there's other things, especially now to lean into the, the secular ideological partisanship and polarization and that, that's happening. And because we have automobiles, we can just drive to a congregation that is an echo chamber of what I've already thought of. And I think that's a bad thing. And I, um, but I don't know, maybe second Peter might think that was a good thing. I'm not sure. But, but I think, Ralph, that's the point, right? That Second Peter might be the, the, the writing in the New Testament that can get mm, operationalized to say that this is the scriptural way for us to engage. And, and again, I keep pushing to say yeah. we're not talking about 
non-believers. We're talking about Christians that have already shared community, prayerful space, baptismal space, sacred ritual space with each other, right? And now because we've gotten to a different understanding of what these traditions mean and who we are, uh, you know, there there's a fracturing that's happening and that Second Peter may actually, I would say not only participating in, but maybe creating, we can get to that get to that letter later. But the point is to say that's an option. That's not the option. And uh, it is an option in our scripture that we need to keep in that perspective. Awesome. I'm going to offer one very concrete thing. If preachers are listening, going, yeah, but I don't know what I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. What I want to point out is look at all of the things that the opening 11 verses say God has given as a free gift to Christian community that then should be the ideal towards which we strive. You know, starting in verse two, grace and peace and knowledge. But then starting in verse five, it's which seems to be echoing the fruit of the spirit a little bit the, in Galatians. We've got faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, endurance. Now we're back to Romans, maybe godliness and mutual affection with love. If we said these, God's given these things in the community, don't throw them away. No, don't, don't throw them away. And I would say not only don't throw them away, but how to use the preaching moment to invite the community to ask, how do we operationalize this and bring this fruit into manifestation in our community now? What does this look like now for us, right? How can we do this better? I think that's really, really an important opportunity. Awesome. Anything, uh, Christopher, before we move to week two? Oh, this is good stuff. I'm glad that we're having this conversation. All right. Then week two continues verses 16 of chapter one through two, two, yeah. and then picks up some later stuff, 15 through 19 in uh, chapter two. And here, I think, is a, a, an issue that is so important is what do we do with false prophets? <laughs> right. Because this is, not, this is not just a New Testament problem. The Old Testament has some ways of knowing whether a prophet comes and is false. And you can read about that in Deuteronomy 18. Uh, I don't think you referred to that at this point. It, we only gave you so many words, but, um, you know, the test for false prophets, if a prophet speaks in any name other than the Lord's, then you know that prophet's false. If the prophet tells you to do anything um, against the law, that's a false prophet, too, basically. That's right. that's right. Or if a false prophet says stuff that's just wrong, doesn't happen in, in real, that's the other one. But what do you think? What do we do with false prophets? Uh and what's the underlying issue for our community today? Yeah. It's a fastball. Yeah. Christopher, you want to take it or you want me to try? I'll let you have first crack at it. He's okay. he's really yeah, dealing was, today. He's dealing. He's dealing today. We can we can handle it. We can I know it. you guys can. I'm, <laughs> by the way, I asked that. I don't know the answer. I try to always ask questions on these that aren't got yet. But or what do you think? Because I don't know. Yeah, I I. So I, you're right. I only had so many words. So it was one of those things where I had to kind of pick what was really what I thought was really important to um, pick up in the conversation. I typically expect people to to really want to track the prophetic um, sort of the prophetic speak of the text without recognizing that what they're doing is what Second Peter is intentionally doing in the Greek, which is playing with memory. And so the lectionary really for me the beginning point of talking about. Um, prophets, prophecy, the work of the Holy Spirit, is to first start with the work of Christian memory. What do we recall? What do we, I mean, this is the language that um, is running through chapter one, right into chapter two. What do you remember? And then the letter itself begins to model what that kind of memory, that kind of working reminiscence within Christian community does. When we recall these moments of um, encounter, right? Divine encounter, transfiguration, right? Mm -hmm. We recall now, if it's really working, we are recalling and naming and looking for the working of the Holy 
Holy Spirit, which helps us then think about matters of interpretation. And then again, these false prophets become uh, pop up. So I always say one of the first things I want to do with the false prophet, with the false prophet conversation, it's the first say, what are, I think Second Peter is asking us, what are we remembering first in our stories of what we consider to be um, holy, scriptural, right? Um, the word of God that is interpreted among us. What what are those first? That will then help us start talking about what is prophetic or false prophecy in our midst. Well, and I think one of the things too, when you look at the, if we locate this again as the baby of the New Testament and these early Christian That's communities, fine. is the question also of times of growth and times of uncertainty and times of crisis, how those are unfortunately also the t- periods of time when people are most susceptible to looking for certainty in places maybe they shouldn't, for looking uh, looking towards people who will tell them what they want to hear in order to assuage their fears or their worries. And I think in 2023, this is a message that resonates in these times of uncertainty and so forth. And so I think that's one of the first things I think about with thinking about false prophets is that false prophets arise in certain situations. I think Deuteronomy is a good example of this as well, an Israelite community preparing to enter the promised land and looking at what that will mean to them. Uh, We see this again in the, I think of Isaiah and Jeremiah and their competitions. These are really difficult times in the history of the kingdom of Israel. And so this false prophecy, true prophecy dynamic becomes especially important in these hard times. And so I think that's one of the things again, we can keep in mind as we think about this text for our present day, is that concern. I love that, Christopher, too, because I think the piece that we end up seeing this language of prophet and false prophet happening is to think about how we get these larger stories, as both you and Rolf are po- pointing to in the Old Testament of Israel in these difficult times. Second Peter is going to use the language dark times, right? This rising star in the dark times. But this is localized pressure and tension and conflict here in Second Peter. And that's actually one of the things that I, so believe it or not, actually like about Second Peter is that it, it, it actually doesn't um, blow up the conflict and the tension in the dark times as, um, as sort of a national piece. It is a local tension and struggle. And I think for preachers who are preaching, it is an opportunity to think about it. How do we name and think about the local places, it will, it will, the local tensions and struggles in our communities that could be creating these dualisms. I mean, apocalyptic, the light and the dark, right? And people are sort of fracturing in ways that are not reflective of this sort of shared belief and community identity. So this becomes a way of naming um, the danger of labeling. So there's that, those words again, Raul, right? Labeling, profiling, stereotyping, stigmatizing our own constituency, our own members, our own brothers and sisters in community with us as false prophets or false prophecy versus adjudicating and mediating in those spaces the, that the witness of the witness that led up to this is Peter's rehearsing the encounter at the transfiguration, right? The encounter of Jesus on the holy mountain is the language. What are those holy mountain moments of this community that we can preach about and remind our, remind our communities of that create again, those bridges that creates those connections or reconciles those connections. Yeah, that's really rich. I'm just trying to figure out even like, I think you have which stories we choose to tell. I mean, it's interesting. The the the, the regular common lectionary doesn't do much with Second Peter. It's choosing not to do that. Right. But, if, but this book does deserve a hearing, right? Right. But as it does, it is interesting to see. It goes back to the moment. Uh, here, um, uh, of the Transfiguration story. Yes. And for me, it's verse 17, that Jesus received honor and glory, and that 
both New Testament and Old Testament, the Hebrew world and the Greco-Roman world were honor and shame yeah. cultures. And that the one who was shamed to death by the empire in crucifixion, because that's what crucifixion was, it was all about shame, is given honor and glory. And we are then to be a cruciform community where we don't crucify each other. That's right. Yeah. In fact, maybe maybe we honor those, most honor those who are being attacked. Yeah, yeah. And the, and the other piece, Rolf, just to stay with even that verse, the other piece not to miss is that the moment we get, this is my beloved son, is actually the moment that we're, back, we're at Matthew's baptism account. Right. So, I mean, so we, you get really here um, a, a sort of a naming of a lifting up, a taking back to the moment of transfiguration as a, like this cruciform people, honor and glory, as you said, and then the power of baptism, right? That, transform, that, that transforms us, right? That connects us, it gives us a new kinship, a new family. Um, and, and, then, and then Second Peter goes on and starts going into these languages, this language of false prophets. But we cannot miss the beauty, even the way in which these two stories sort of collide and come together as significant pauses and moments that get recalled and retold at this moment. The sort of anchoring. I mean, I see, I love this part because I see it as an anchoring moment in Second Peter. That's, that's really powerful. And it reminds me, I'm writing... Uh, my way through Mark right now. And Mark, where you see the transfiguration, you see it right before all of the controversies that Jesus engages in with his opponents in Jerusalem. And the, again, that way the transfiguration grounds Jesus's mission and ministry before those final days. So that's, yeah, that's great. So thank you. All right, let's move to week three, if that's all right, uh, all right. which is the final week uh, of the series that we have uh, stretched out July 16th. And uh, they skip over the proverb at the end of chapter two, which is kind of <laughs> funny, uh, but that's all right. You read it for yourselves, everybody. Uh, <laughs> then Peter, the letter gets then to what the purpose of the letter is that you should remember the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken through apostles. That's right. And this seems to be right about the promise of the second coming. Yeah. yeah. I, so I love this section. Um, I, it, um, I love where it begins and a place that it ends up skipping over that I'm like, but you can't skip over that part. And Christopher, this is probably where we can have some of our fun is um, I actually think of this conversation versus 15 and 16 and three should be a part of this, bringing Paul into into this story, because, I mean, here becomes the richness. Right. So here at the beginning in the first in, in chapter three, all these traditions literally get braided together. Right. Um, and so you get the prophets braided with the apostles where the Lord's commandment is there. You get Peter and Paul named. And here's what you what we cannot miss is three one begins by referencing back that this is the second word. So the writer of second of, of second Peter, Simeon Peter, right, is identifying self as as participating in what the epistolary tradition of the early Christian epistolary tradition alongside Paul. So we get the Christian letter writing um, piece also signaled here. Both Paul and Peter are writers of Christian, of, of Christian correspondence and tradition. I mean, you get the fullness of this, the expectation of the coming, the understanding of other other worlds, right? Uh, angels. I mean, all of this is right here in um, uh, in Second Peter three. And one of the things that I love about it, <laughs> before we talk about what's difficult about it, is it it is the fact of what does it mean to preach about the richness of our Christian tradition, like the richness of it. We don't just have prophets, we have apostles. We do not just have Paul, but we have Peter. We have the risen Christ. We have the questions of 
that are arising from the community because it's taken too long for, for Christ to come back. And is anyone taking time? It's 2023 and we're still waiting for the Lord to come back. Right? <laughs> right? And, and so if you're going to come back at all, Lord, should you come back today? Right? I mean, so, and so some of this, it feels like it is an invitation for us to stand in the moment of difficulty, of tension, of stress, and to look around and say to the congregation, but look at all of this faith, all of this hope, all of these stories, all of these practices and ways of being that make us us. Right? Amen. I get excited about this section. As you can see. So I love this section too. And one of the things that I love about it is I'm going to point right to 15 and 16, like you were talking about. Please. One, I just got done teaching Romans and I always like, I like to read. By the way, listeners, you're, you can change. You're free in Jesus Christ in the party. Bad. Add verses. This is, there's, this is not, uh, there's no law here. This is just a guide. Uh, yeah. two, two of us say you should yes, add verses. You Go should, you six. should. Absolutely. That's three. 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 Well, three. But I always, three. I like to read them at the end of our Romans time, uh, verse 16. In the NIV, it says, it's time about Paul. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. <laughs> I love but it. But the, the thing that I think is so great about them, and it goes right to what you're saying, Shively, is that there is the acknowledgement in Peter that the words of Scripture, Paul included, are hard to wrestle with, and they require... That's people to take them seriously, to wrestle with them, to think and pray with them, to hold tight to them. I think about this That's a lot. Right. You know, all three of us are in theological education. And there are some, right. some factions that ask the question, you know, what is theological education worth? Why do we need higher theological education? And part of it is because these things are hard to wrestle with. There are things that it takes that time and that engagement. And it's beautiful to see this right at the beginning of the Christian story. Second Peter says, That's right. it's hard, but wrestle with That's it hard. nonetheless. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I want to, I got a question about something I don't understand, but first I'm, um, I want to, I think a, a, a good news word here is Jesus has made some promises to us. Mm -hmm. Some of them have already been kept, like mm -hmm. the resurrection, mm -hmm. like the coming of the Spirit, falling upon disciples, the spread of the church. Some, some are being fulfilled during our lives. There's promises kept. And some are for the future. Yeah. And uh, the letter says, you can even add verse 13, in accordance with, I got to see if it's in there. Maybe it is. No, but we cut that out by accident, I'm sure. In accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness is at home, implying righteousness maybe is not home here. That's right. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting, strive to be found at peace. Yeah. While, while we're waiting, can we be at peace? All right, here's what I don't understand. I, I literally don't understand verse four. Verse four, let's go there. All, I'm asking you too. Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since our ancestors died, and that might be the Old Testament ancestors, it might be the first generation of Christians, who knows? All things continue as they were from the beginning of, I don't know what that means. All things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Help me out. So, I'll, so a little bit of context. When we hit verse, when we hit verse four, the, what you see happening is Second Peter is rehearsing the point of tension, right? So the, what Second Peter is rehearsing is the question that is being asked by the particular group that the letter writers don't align with. So a, they don't like the question. <laughs> they don't like the fact that the question of Jesus is, come, is being raised at all. Like, don't it, it's going to happen. Don't ask when, right? So they're so that so they're simply parroting back to that. I think you're absolutely right, Rolf, in that wh where which fathers, ancestors, witnesses are is Second Peter 
um, talking about, I would actually say Second Peter's talking about both sets because the, the chapter sets up by talking about the prophets and the apostles and the commandments. So Second Peter, as the baby of the canon of the scripture, has at its disposal the writers the fullness of the tradition. We've seen it on. The, we've done. A, I think we've done a really good job in this podcast of showing the fullness of the tradition that's being pulled on. So I think that that actually is a very loaded, loaded um, imagery, imagery there. Creation, the the um, last thing I'll say about what, what makes that difficult is the way in which uh, time, time is understood as working in the ancient world, particularly during this time. And Christopher, I would really love for you to um, um, help me on this, um, particularly with Revelation and this. But it, for me, this is sounds this is the apocalyptic piece. Time looks and plays differently. The understanding of time is different here. So if you're reading it, thinking about time in our current in our current moment, it's it's going to be hard. What we have to think about is um, Second Peter sort of sees God and wants us to recognize that time is a construct that. God and our faith does not operate within. All right. So, I mean, so when you keep reading through the chapter, it isn't fundamentally blowing up the construct of time and saying, when it, this doesn't work with how, t how things are counted with God. And from creation, our mapping of time has always been limited and out of step with God. There, this is where I say it becomes very apocalyptic. Now, Christopher, Fix me where I have gone wrong or and fill in no, what I didn't. I think, I think you're right on track. But I think one of the things, this goes back to that meeting of cultures that we're talking about. One of the things that the author is interacting with are the way in which Greek philosophical traditions thought of, of the world as eternal and unchanging from right. the beginning some, I mean, some Aristotle is even not so convinced the world has a beginning, but the whole point being that it will endure forever and it will never change. And it just keeps on going kind of, as he says here, everything goes on as it has since the beginning. And Peter operating again in a, in a world in which that kind of endless future doesn't exist. The future does not stretch out towards eternity in the same form as it does. And so I think that's uh, an important thing to think about, especially because in 2023, we are heirs of that Greek tradition in the sense that's that right. we primarily understand the future as a limitless thing, wherein everything will stay. The things change, of course, but the word, the fundamentals of the universe don't. Whereas Peter saying, is that's saying right. in this letter, that's not true at all. Everything will change, and it will change when you least expect it, as we get to uh, 310, that you cannot think of it as this just day after day, the same things apply, because all of a sudden, one day they won't apply anymore. And so I think that you're, you're very right to point, to point out how different this is than we generally think of as of how time works and how the world is related to time. And just a nice sort of, you know, scholarly tidbit here, too, is uh, particularly within um, Petrine studies, Second Peter studies, a lot of scholars now we see this as um, an indicator that there's actually a particular ph philosophical thinking that's being taken on here, which is sort of an Epicurean notion of time, uh, this notion of providence and providential that Second Peter is trying to dis to disrupt um, here. So it also, it, it also is a space where we think that the critique is one of a particular philosophical thinking that is um, activated within the community that Second Peter is um, challenging and, um, and, and, uh, and uprooting and saying that that's not how our Christian understanding of time works and what God God is doing. Uh, now, I have to say a disclaimer with this to say, again, I think we have to stay mindful and aware and vigilant to, to say that the way the writers go about um, um, calling out and naming 
um, the, the a particular idea and community within the community as not having, not aligning to its thinking is a problem that we need to be aware of, right? So it's one thing that, to challenge the idea. It's another, it's a whole other piece to think about what becomes the Christian way of dealing with a disagreement of ideas within community. And so the way Second Peter um, challenges the other ideas that it doesn't agree with is not something we want to affirm. At least I wouldn't want to do that. Well, there you go, friends. That's the best 45 minutes you're ever going to hear on Second Peter. You can listen to it again, but why don't we just close with the way the letter closes. We, uh, May, may you all grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory. Amen.